Then we arrived. That means it's starting. Welcome, everyone. I don't miss an opportunity to do that. Um, thanks for coming to the North Carolina Maritime Museum today and braving the weather and the parking situations. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming to the museum uh, here on Front Street, and I hope that you're having a good day. Um, I will let you know that this presentation, at least these slides and uh, my voice and also my, my picture is being shared over the internet right now. Um, you guys are all safe. There's no camera pointed at you. And this recording, this uh, microphone is not pointed in your direction either. Um, but for those that are watching online, thank you for joining us today. Um, <clears throat> it will be a little interesting because I'm still getting used to having two audiences, uh, one here in front of me and people that I can't see that are watching uh, through Zoom and uh, through our Facebook page. Um, that being said, I do want to thank the H2O Captain uh, Eco Tours, who uh, graciously donated some uh, funds to cover our Zoom account for the year, so that people watching online at from the comfort of their own home or wherever they are uh, could do so. Um, this presentation is also being recorded uh, and will later be uploaded to the museum's YouTube page so that you can tell your friends about it in, in case they missed it and they can go and watch it later. Um, and you can watch it again uh, if, if you missed something today. Um, last little bit of uh, uh, busy work before I jump into the presentation here is our next Scheduled Maritime Heritage Series lecture is on, uh, let's see, August 10th, and is titled By Hook or By Crook. Uh, and the uh, description is ranked amongst the fiercest pirates from the golden age of piracy. Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed's stories are one that daytime TV series wish they could write. This presentation may not be appropriate for younger children, uh, considering the topics dis discussed, but that lecture focuses on uh, two notorious female pirates uh, from the golden age of piracy. So you can learn about their exploits and their lives. Um, and it's a pretty, that will be broadcast live as well and recorded. Uh, but today's lecture uh, is family friendly and it is on the surfing history of North Carolina. So what I'm gonna do is I've got a slideshow set up. 
uh, and I'm going to tell you about the images that we see here um, and talk about North Carolina's uh, role in the history of the sport of surfing, but also how uh, certain people and, and, and other uh, influences um, impacted North Carolina. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to dive right in here. Uh, if you have any questions, Miss, maybe hold them to the end, and I'll go through a Q and A period, or maybe I'll stop a, a couple places along the way um, and try to get to all the questions uh, that come in. So <clears throat> I've got a lot of pictures. Uh, the first one on the title slide is from 1966. And the 1960s is probably when a lot of people think, yeah, you know, that's when surfing came to North Carolina. Um, it was a, it was uh, gaining popularity um, on the West Coast and television shows were being made that had surfing in it and movies and such. Um, but it's not exactly the case uh, from, from what we learned. Um, so, you know, what did we do to, to put this story together? Um, well, we looked at lots of different things. Um, we looked at various sources of information, um, you know, historic, uh, historical newspaper archives, magazines, and other published materials. Uh, and then we also interviewed a lot of people um, from some of the early uh, 60s and late 50s even, um, of surfing in, in North Carolina. Um, this, this is a kind of a collage of you know, some of the examples of postcards and newspaper articles and, and uh, promotional um, advertisements and magazines um, that all focus on this story of surfing in North Carolina. Um, you know, why did we, why did we pick surfing to talk about surfing. I mean, we're a maritime museum and, you know, so pirates and shipwrecks, that's pretty obvious on why we talk about those, but, but why surfing? I mean, the definition of maritime itself is of or related to the sea or to the coast. Well, you don't get much more related to the sea and the coast than, you know, with surfing. You're, you're right there on the beach and you're in the surf zone, you're in the water, you're in the ocean. Um, so we have a history in North Carolina of promoting the coast for tourism dating back uh, to, to the 1800s. Uh, people were coming here to go sailing and fishing and get away from the uh, mosquito infested areas inland and get out to the beach for the sea breeze um, and to swim in the water and cool off. Um, you know, so there's a history to that. that providing recreation for tourists, for people coming to the coast of North Carolina. Um, and surfing is a part of that history. Um, so what is this timeline project? Um, well, we wanted to see uh, how far we could go back into the, in the history of surfing in North Carolina. Um, you know, what, what could we dig up? There had been other people that had done some uh, work before us, uh, and two of those two of those gentlemen, we 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 met with them and, and talked and learned about what they did. Uh, kind of uncovered. Um, one of them was Peter Fritzler out of UNC Wilmington, uh, and uh, Joseph Skipper Funderburg, who was also from the Wilmington area. Now you could see their focus was just on the New Hanover County. Uh, Brunswick County uh, beaches of southeastern North Carolina. Uh, they got a little bit into maybe Pender County and Onslow County, but they really focused on the Cape Fear region. Um, there was a temporary exhibit that ran at the library on UNC Wilmington's campus. Um, and then Joseph uh, Funderburg actually put together a book, uh, kind of a picture book, if you will, but it had a lot of good information in it on the surfing history of the, the Cape Fear region. Um, and they shared a lot with us, um, some of which I'll cover in this presentation. So um, it was a pretty fun project. And when, when my supervisor at the time told me that I could get paid to research and learn about surfing, 
uh, I was kind of uh, surprised, but also very excited. Um, I didn't think I could do that. But when you say the word maritime, a lot of things are are fair game, I guess. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go really into the history of the whole sport of surfing across the, the world, um, because that I believe there's probably actually like semester long classes in some universities that that cover that. <laughs> and it takes a while. There's a lot of uh, research that, that went into it. Um, yeah, but I did do want to kind of throw up this this uh, picture here. This is a depiction of Captain James Cook's uh, Anchorage uh, at the Sandwich Islands or, or, or Hawaii, if you will, um, you know, the act of surfing had been carried out for many years in, in, in certain places uh, in the Pacific. Um, and early, early uh, explorers witnessed and even recorded the, the accounts. Um, when you zoom in on uh, <clears throat> this, this drawing, um, in the bottom to the left, there's someone paddling on a board um, so they you know they witnessed people riding the waves and, and in some cases they were using these these boards surfboards if you will as transportation of getting around on the shoreline of the islands um, i think they also did it for fun um, so the opportunity for north carolinians to learn about surfing uh, came through a lot of newspaper articles. Um, the one on the left here is out of the North Carolinian, which was printed in Elizabeth City. And this was in June of 1876, June 21, 1876. And the author of this article, which could have been read by anybody, especially in Elizabeth City, um, goes on to describe exactly what he witnessed uh, in, in the Hawaiian islands of people surfing. He describes the board, he describes the process, he describes how they catch the wave, how they ride the wave. That was 1876. So if you happen to be from that area, North Carolina and read this newspaper, you know, who's to say that in 1876, that was, that was printed June 21, you know, prime tourist season for the Outer Banks, Maybe you read that paper and say, you know what? I'm going to try it. I'm going to grab a board from somewhere. Maybe, I, maybe it's a board that washed up from an old shipwreck. Who knows? <laughs> um, and you know, go out there and try the surfing right there. And then um, the drawing that's depicted here uh, is from published from a incidents of a whaling voyage, and that was 1841. And the caption is "Sandwich Islanders playing in the surf." So. It's very possible that someone from North Carolina could have even read that book and seen that picture. Um, so they're getting information about this sport um, and that could have prompted someone to go try it out. We don't know, we don't, there's some things that just weren't written down and pictures weren't taken. Um, so we, we may never know, uh, but it's fun to think that at that time period, people in North Carolina could have been learning about the sport of surfing. Um, here's an, another uh, news article. This one is out of Edenton, North Carolina, and it was from 1888 out of the Fisherman and Farmer. Um, and the author who's listed there, Don Arturo, he, I mean, he describes while he was in Hawaii, um, we saw the natives shooting the surf. This very exciting evolution uh, is performed uh, by going out into the surf armed with a thin board about five feet long and about 18 inches wide. And when an extra heavy swell rolls in, uh, he turns his back to the sea, lays on the board and is carried inshore with lightning-like rapidity. So again, describing the act of surfing, 1888 out of Edenton. Now the author, I don't think was from Edenton. I think they picked up articles um, from from all over and just ran them in in papers um so again another description of of surfing that could have been read by someone in north carolina um so when did surfing actually begin in north carolina i don't know i don't know if we'll ever know 
Um, here's a postcard scene from about 1910, and the cat the title of the postcard reads "Surf Scene, Beaufort, North Carolina." Well, I hope there's no surf in Beaufort. <laughs> if there is, that means it's probably a hurricane, <laughs> and the waves are breaking on Front Street. That's not good. We don't want that. We want hurricane swells, but we don't want the hurricane to hit us. Um, but I think what they meant was nearby Beaufort, North Carolina, because uh, most of the other places probably weren't as well known. And so this postcard company uh, said, well, surf scene at near Beaufort. And so it probably meant Atlantic Beach. It may have even been out on Shackelford. Um, but in the picture, you don't see anybody surfing, do you? Nobody's out there surfing 1910. Um, maybe just maybe they were out earlier before the picture was taken. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Here's another postcard image. This one's titled Surf Bathing Scene. Uh, we know plenty of this was taking place in the stylish bathing suits that they chose to wear. Um, same time period, around 1910. Um, and this picture is probably actually taken out uh, on Bird Shoals which is the sandbar between us and Beaufort Inlet. Um, it is possible it could have been taken on the Beaufort waterfront. There was more of a beach and less uh, bulkhead and boardwalk at this time period. Um, and a lot of the Rachel Carson Reserve was didn't even exist. It was tidal flats and salt marshes. You could see the ocean from Front Street all anywhere on Front Street. Um, but but nonetheless, nobody's surfing in this picture. No one even has a board. Um, yeah, but we tried to comb through all of these uh, images in, in that had been scanned and put in the put in archives um, in North Carolina. Um, yeah, so so when did surfing begin? Who were the first wa wave riders in North Carolina? Yeah, I mean, it, it, maybe it depends on what you consider riding a wave and surfing. Um, you. Here's, here's an example of some people that may have ridden waves. Doesn't really mean they were surfing though. Um, the upper left is a depiction of uh, Native Americans in their dugout canoe. Um, some of them standing up and even kind of poling themselves through the shallow waters. But who's to, who's to say that maybe they went on a fishing expedition out the inlet and off the beach? You know, it's very possible that they could have used the waves to ride back into the beach with them. Um, next picture. There we go. Um, on the top right, some whalers off of Shackleford Banks have a little surf boat. We even called them surf boats. Uh, double-ended pilot boat, if you will. They launched into the surf to chase after whales. I'm sure they used the energy of the wave and the surf to ride back into the beach. And there's two people standing up on that picture, a harpooner on the bow and a, uh, someone steering in the back, uh, the stern of the boat. Um, do we call it surfing? Do we call them surfers? I, I don't think so. Now, the bottom picture is actual photographic evidence of the U.S. lifesavers that were stationed out at Kitty Hawk on the Outer Banks, practicing their their surf boat drills, but definitely riding a wave back to the beach. You see, I circled it there on the bottom of the picture. You can see the breaking wave right there, and they're they're using it to get back to the beach. Um, do we call them surfers? We call them surf men, the surf men of the U.S. Life Saving Service. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they were surfers, but maybe in their off time they were. They, maybe they read those newspaper articles. Um, you know, the debate of when did surfing happen in the United States uh, is still being hashed out uh, in some ways. Um, the picture on the left is of George Freeth. Uh, he's, he's credited with introducing surfing uh, to California uh, and on the West Coast in the summer of 1907. Um, but if you do some further reading, you will find that there were three Hawaiians who went to the um, St. Matthews Military Academy in San Mateo, California in the 1880s and carved a surfboard from a, a redwood tree and took it out at the San Lorenzo River mouth 
and went surfing in July of 1885. It didn't get much mention in the newspapers and it didn't get much publicity. So that's probably why we don't know about it. So I think surfing actually took place in the United States uh, well before George Freeth came to our country. Um, when you think about it, uh, it it's pro, you know it's possible that they those, the Hawaiians just tried that just did that there they were they were from Hawaii they had done that was their heritage uh, and they were in California at this military academy and they were probably like we're bored um, you know there's waves here uh, you know it would kind of remind us of home and everyone knew how to make surfboards in Hawaii so they all they needed was some something to to uh, you know, carve the wood and shape the board and the next thing you know. They're out there surfing, but nobody took pictures. Nobody wrote about it. It was probably a pretty unpopulated area. So not too many people knew about it. Um, so that's probably actually when surfing came to the, to the mainland uh, of, of our country then in the 1880s. Um, and so you know, focusing back in on North Carolina, here's a, a newspaper account uh, from the Western part of the state. Uh, someone from uh, Watauga County visits the coast in 1894, and he'd spent several days at, at Wrightsville Beach. Um, and this, so this was in the 1890s. And, and in his description, he says, all sorts and sizes were riding the waves during the entire day. Now, if I, if I was a betting man, and I, I would probably put money down that they weren't riding surfboards, and that what, what Mr. Holesclaw was actually referring to was that they were just body surfing and bobbing up and down in the surf and maybe letting the waves push them in, not riding the board. Um, but he, he has no further description. He has no pictures or drawings or anything. So we, we can't really say for sure, can we? But it's more than likely that that's what he meant. Uh, now, this is a postcard um, that was dated 1907. This is the Seashore Hotel at Wrightsville Beach, a very popular tourist destination um, in that area um, in that time. Uh, this is out of a collection out of the New Hanover County Public Library. Um, now, when you look at this photo, there's lots of people. There's the Seashore Hotel in the background. There's lots of people in the water. Um, and then you zoom in up front, it, near the bottom of the postcard, that sure looks like somebody sitting on a board. Were they surfing? Uh, I don't know. Um, so it's very possible that this could have been one of the earliest documentations of somebody surfing in North Carolina in 1907. Um, but if you read underneath here on my slide, and, you, and then you start to really, really examine this picture, uh, things look a little bit off to me. Um, you know, just just the, the 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 way that the people kind of fade out into the distance, um, these buildings and structures back here, um, something just doesn't look right to me. There's a lot of people in the water, but there doesn't look like hardly anybody on the beach. Um, and 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 the reality is is that people that were making postcards were doing Photoshop well before Photoshop existed. Uh, and they were actually cutting and pasting and doing things to postcards. Um, I mean, they were they, they were promotional. They were a way to get you to come to a place. And that's what this was, was an advertisement for the Seashore Hotel. And look at all these people here. It must be a great place. It must be somewhere we need to go. We should go next year. Um, it's wonderful. Everyone's enjoying it. Look, uh, but whether or not that's actually... The case and what this picture, you know, really, you know, if this was really the truth, we don't, we don't know. Um, now we do know that this gentleman on the right here, Alexander Ford, he's a native of South Carolina. He he was a writer and he went to Hawaii and he loved it so much he stayed uh, seasonally and 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 for a long time uh, for and would and would go back every year and he was kind of the founder of the outrigger. Uh, canoe club in Waikiki Beach, um, but he wrote about surfing in Hawaii, and on the left is one of his articles, and he had pictures. There's pictures of the boards. There's pictures of them riding the waves. Uh, he wrote about it in this in this Collier's Outdoor Magazine, and that was published uh, nationwide, so anybody could read it. 
Well, I bring this up because someone from North Carolina did read it. And there's his picture right there. That's uh, Burke Bridgers from Wilmington, North Carolina. And that happens to be his picture from uh, when he was at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, but he lived in Wilmington. He went to college at UNC. Uh, and his father owned a lumber mill. And then he reads this article about surfing in Hawaii. And he sees the boards. I mean, they're made of solid wood. And the article describes the boards. And he says, you know what? My dad's got a lumber mill. He's got all kinds of great wood for making a surfboard, uh, juniper and cypress and such. And you can get big, wide planks. And that's what he does. He gets some boards. He, he shapes them and he makes them. Uh, and then they try them out at Wrightsville Beach. And so that would have been about 1909. And he write and 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 he finds out that it's a little more difficult than than what he sees in the pictures. It might look easy, uh, but then actually trying it was a different story. So he writes to Alexander Ford and he says, "Hey, we're having trouble standing up on the surfboards. The little kids, it's no problem at all. You know, they weigh less. Their center of gravity is lower, um, and they could get pushed into a wave and stand right up. Uh, but for the older guys, it was a little more difficult." So he writes and he says, he describes what, what uh, the, the boards that they use and what they're made, have, made out of um, and what they're doing. And so Alexander Ford replies and says, well, this is what's happening in Hawaii. And he writes back to him. Um, but that was the article there. Uh, Ca Carolina man writes for surfboard instructors. So that instructions, that's 1909. Is one of the earliest accounts that we have that somebody did actually go surfing in North Carolina at Wrightsville Beach. And Mr. Bridgers actually goes on to explain that, you know, they had some difficulty paddling out through the rough waves in the surf. And he was excited because they were going to be building a pier soon. And he thought that maybe they could jump off the end of the pier and then, then they wouldn't have to paddle through it. Whether or not he ended up doing that, I don't know. But I do know that people do that. Um, I'm, I might have been known to do that, but I'm not going to admit to it. I just I'll say it, I might have been known to do that. Um, but now that that's so that's some of the early stuff that Skipper Thunderberg out of Wilmington had had found and shared with us. Um, you know, here's a 1909 same same uh, year. This was an article out of the Wilmington Morning Star, and it talks about. Uh, prepare the, the sports on Labor Day uh, festivities, um, a, a attractive program prepared for Lumina. And the Lumina was another um, resort at Riceville Beach. And you can see I highlighted, it says, uh, the things that were be happening at the Lumina on Labor Day, uh, they will definitely a attract a large crowd. The first event is a canoe race, a swimming contest. And the third number will be the surfboard sports always interesting and entertaining for spectators. So that was 1909, um, more evidence that, that someone was surfing in that time period. Here's another postcard, 1917. This is, a, this is another postcard, so you gotta take it with a grain of salt. Looks still, it looks a little interesting to me because there's the Lumina Resort at, at uh, Riceville Beach. Um, and this is supposed to be the ocean, I guess, but it just seems so close to, to the, uh, there seems to be not much beach between the, the, the water and the structure. Um, you know, I don't know, but we, we, we look there in the left and, and there's definitely somebody holding a surfboard uh, and that's 1917. Whether or not this was a, you know, accurate and, and really happened, um, you know, we don't know. Um, so we're gonna kind of move up and down the coast and look at these different examples. Here's a newspaper article that talks about the Virginia Dare Day festivities up uh, in Manio. And they talk about that over at Virginia Dare Shores, which was, they were referring to the beach across Roanoke Sound from, from Roanoke Island, um, is that there was gonna be surfing demonstrations put on by Willie Kayama and his group from Hawaii. So this was a, actual account of someone from Hawaii that was coming to demonstrate the sport here in North Carolina. And that was in, in 1928. Uh, now the picture on the left was from another um, demonstration which took place up at Virginia Beach a few years later. Um, 
1931, and that was out of the Charlotte Observer ran the story on that event. Um, but there at 1928 in Dare County, uh, they performed out there. They did uh, native uh, you know, traditional music from Hawaii. They did dancing demonstrations, but they also did surfing demonstrations. Um, so that's possibly one of the earliest accounts of, of surfing happening in Dare County, um, 1928. Um, now I put these pictures up here because in the 1920s, a young boy out of Virginia Beach was, uh, was came to be known as a one of the one of the best surfers. Uh, in North Carolina. He eventually moved to North Carolina. He actually had a, a shop there, but that's a picture of him there with his, uh, with a famous surfer from California. Um, and you look, the, the the man on the left has the really big surfboard, but then the little boy, he got, he's got a little surfboard. Um, and that was from 1933. Um, so he was began surfing at a young age, but uh, he would come down to North Carolina to go surfing. He, he eventually found out that the waves were better in North Carolina than they were in Virginia Beach. Um, and he eventually even opened up a surf shop operation in the 1960s in Kill Devil Hills, and it was known as uh, Holland Surf Shop. Um, but that's a picture of Bob Holland there surfing at the Nags Head Pier in 1963. Um, and I actually had uh, the opportunity to talk with him before he passed away, and he told me a lot about his surfing exploits and his business that he had there. Um, you know, by occupation, Bob was a harbor pilot and he and he, uh, he guided ships into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but in his off time, he was always down in North Carolina surfing. Um, and he had this surf shop uh, as well. Um, but he told me that he would, to, to get down to the, to the Outer Banks faster, he would just drive down the beach. He didn't, go in through Chesapeake and come down the highway and across the bridge over to sound. It took too long. They would just get on the beach at low tide and drive down to the outer banks all the way down, uh, right along the water. Um, so in the, in the thirties, we start to see every, you know, more promotion of, of surfboards and that, and that you could build your own surfboard. Um, you know, a lot of these were, were things that were made uh, in, in California, but you know, people in North Carolina, you know, the young, young Bob Holland and his little surfboard, they started to realize that, you know, we could do that here too. I mean, Burke Bridgers did it back in, in, in Wilmington uh, in the first decade of the 20th century. So, you know, let's, let's continue that, you know, here's a magazine that, that, um, you know, there were instructions given on how to build a surfboard if you wanted to, making a, a, a surfboard. There's the children's version right there, I guess. Um, and so these were all, all ways that surfing was coming to North Carolina. Um, in the 1940s, uh, we had in the neighboring county, uh, Camp Lejeune at Onslow Beach, a lot of people that ended up in the Marine Corps, uh, some, were, some of them were from California. Well, what they did in California in their off time, surfing, could take place here in North Carolina. Um, so there were records that some of the, the, the young men that had joined the military that in the Marine Corps that were stationed there uh, at Camp Lejeune uh, could get out to the beach and go surfing. Um, so that's an, another way that, it, that the sport was coming to North Carolina. Um, this is an example of, of the promotional material for the area, uh, the summer capital of the South, Moorhead City. This was printed in about 1950. And you can see there's someone riding a surfboard. So most of the other pictures are, you know, go for a boat ride, go sailing, go fishing. Um, you know, the women are in swimming suits. <laughs> they might attract some of the young men to, to the area, but, you know, surfing is on there too. So, um, we start to see you know, stuff like that happening. Um, if I had to guess, there was a period where during World War II that you know, a lot of recreational activities might have taken a place on the back burner. It was a pretty serious time. There was a lot of young men going overseas. Um, there wasn't a lot of time for recreation. Uh, there was a lot of effort and production going to, into, the war, into the war. Um, and there was bigger concerns. So we didn't find a lot 
about that time period. It doesn't mean that it wasn't happening, but we just didn't find a lot of, of, about it in North Carolina. Um, so I, I put this picture up here. This, 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 uh, these two gentlemen here, this is David Stick. He later became a historian uh, for the, of, of Dare County uh, and his friend, Tom Fearing, uh, who actually um, did, he did uh, die in, in the war. Um, they were fishing buddies, but they also built a surfboard that they used to paddle out to the wrecks, the shipwrecks offshore so that they could go spear fishing. The picture here, they just went spear fishing off the beach and they caught some sheep's head at one of the, the wrecks right off the beach. Um, but because uh, David did not um, you know, suffer the same fate as Tom in the war, he went on and he opened a business there in Kitty Hawk. And you can see an advertisement for his business, the Kitty Hawk Craft Shop. Um, it lists juniper surfboards for sale. And he opened this craft shop with his wife, Phyllis. So Phyllis and David Stick. This was an advertisement from 1951. Um, so we know that someone was selling surfboards in that area in the 1950s, well before the television shows started picking up uh, surfing. Um, so in the early 60s, though, we, we start to see uh, along the North Carolina coast, um, you, the young, young kids getting out and you know, not having the money to order a surfboard from California, not having the means to make a surfboard or buy one of those ones from, from uh, David Stick. Um, but they did find that if they took these, these yellow and blue mats that were being rented at the beach um, and they inflated them up almost to where they exploded, they became very rigid and they were able to stand on them and ride them like a surfboard. So we see this mat surfing in a lot of the little resort areas along our coast. And I talked to uh, a lot of gentlemen and they said that, oh yeah, we, I was, you know, I grew up here and uh, in Atlantic Beach and my friends were the ones that were renting the beach chairs and these mats. And I would just go take one of the mats and I'd say, hey, you know, let's inflate it some more. And then there we'd go, we'd go, we'd go surfing on them because they couldn't get a surfboard. Um, or maybe they worked at the beach stand themselves and they were the ones uh, renting them. So when it was kind of slow, maybe they'd get out there and, and ride the waves. Um, so the 1960s is when we start to see things like Hollywood and, and, and the films um, and the television shows, you know, picking up on surfing. Um, this was an advertisement out of the Coastland Times and they played the film Ride the Wild Surf. Uh, and unfortunately, it was a film that was kind of had more of a storyline to it. Most surfers don't care about that. We just want to see the surfing footage. Um, but it had some surfing footage in it, too. Uh, but it played at the the uh, um, the Pioneer Theater in downtown Mania, which I think they recently finished restoring. Um, so that was 1965. You could go uh, watch the film and it had surfing in it. Um, you know, but so that was that was a time period where where people were having uh, more opportunity to get out and, and have fun and go to the beach uh, and, and, and partake in, in, in different types of recreation. And, and surfing was one of them. Uh, these were shared to me by uh, George uh, Jackson. He's from Elizabeth City. And here he is with his friends. They would load up their Jeeps and their, their trucks and head down to the Outer Banks for the day, take their surfboards and spend all day just... Uh, riding the waves and, and playing in the water and, and, and getting the suntan. Um, so this was in 1966. Um, you know, here's a early surfboard shop in Atlantic Beach. We know it today as AB Surf Shop, it's pretty popular. Uh, this is their first um, store that they have here. They shared this uh, picture with me. Um, you could, I, the time period probably would have been the, in the late 60s. They opened in 1964, um, and they, they didn't just start as a shop. You know, what, how this went down was that there was a few uh, young, young kids, and they knew that surfing was catching on. They said, how could, you know, we can sell surfboards. We can order the surfboards from California, and we can sell them, but they didn't have a shop. And they actually set up an operation, in, in one, of their, one of their dads was running um, a repair shop for um, amusement uh, equipment. 
So if you remember the, the circle in Atlantic Beach, it, it used to be full of amusement rides um, for many years. And one of, these, one, of these, one of these kids, his dad ran an equipment repair shop because he was the one that would, would fix them and work on those rides. And, and I guess he said, dad, can we sell some surfboards out of here? You know, all the kids are gonna wanna buy them. And, and he let them do that. And eventually, you know, some of them stuck with it and they started their Atlantic Beach AB surf shop. That was in 1964. So now some, some of the other local children and, and, and young people could get surfboards. Um, some of them kind of took matters into their own hands. Instead of ordering the boards from California, they would do it themselves. Here's an advertisement for East Coast surfboards uh, out of Carolina Beach. And this is started in 1964. And you could order a surfboard from, from them. Um, and it, it was started by uh, Harold Petty and Lank, uh, Lancaster. Um, and they were a couple of young men that they, they were probably lifeguarding. Uh, I think some of their first surfing experiences were on a lifeguard rescue board, uh, which looks a lot like a surfboard, except it's just really big. Um, and they said, well, we can, we could just order the foam blanks at this time period. We've switched from wood surfboards to foam with a fiberglass coating. So we could order the foam blanks from California and we could do the fiberglass ourselves. Um, you know, there's stories of the people trying that and, and, and I think it was these guys, they, 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 uh, didn't have any fiberglass cloth. They had the resin. And so they thought that maybe they could use their mother's curtains from the uh, living room and they tore them down and laid them over the foam and poured the resin on there. I mean, it was a disaster, but it was experimental and they were learning and they were trying, they wanted to, to you know, they were entrepreneurs in a way, they wanted to, to sell some surfboards. So on this um, uh, flyer here, it has a price list of, you know, you, a nine foot board was 125 bucks. You could get, um, you know, color graphics and designs, um, you know, also available at extra cost was you you know a wood uh, fin or a skeg uh, on the board. Um, so these were some other fellows that tried uh, making their own surfboards, and they were down in the Carolina Beach area too. This is Sonny Danner, um, and on the left in the dark hair, and then Herman Pritchard. Um, these pictures were actually taken by the News and Observer. I guess they did an article on Carolina Beach and, and these guys making surfboards. This was 1965. Um, I don't think that OSHA would approve of their facility and their operation there. You, you see Harold smoking a cigarette. They don't have their shirts or shoes on. <laughs> They're sanding and planing and fiberglassing. <laughs> um, not really maybe the, the safest environment. Um, but they wanted to make surfboards and they were selling them to their friends and, and to the tourists. Um, you know, that's, here they are testing their equipment out, out at the beach. Um, and this, this is their, uh, their shop, custom surfboards at Atlantic Surf Shop. And that was in this old little cottage right there uh, along the beach road. Um, this was a, another picture from that same News and Observer story. 1965. Um, you know, what a lifestyle, right? Who doesn't want to hang out on the beach and uh, <clears throat> have fun in the water? Um, you know, so up and down the North Carolina coast, you know, we had stories of some of these, these, uh, these uh, folks from the 1960s, you know, getting surfboards, making surfboards. Uh, there was a crew out of Hatteras that the, the, the closest place that they could go to get their surfboards was up in Virginia Beach. And they got tired of driving up there to get surfboards. So they say, well, let's make our own. And they started doing that. Um, I think it was in, in the uh, 1966. Uh, one of the gentlemen pictured here, uh, John Ox, but his friends, John Connor, Buddy Hooper and Doug Meekins, they, they all were getting into the sport. Um, and they got tired of driving up to this place that was in Virginia Beach. And that was actually one of Bob Holland's storefronts um, before he opened a shop in, in uh, Kitty Hawk. Um, so they would make their own boards out in their yard there in Hatteras and Buxton, uh, just like they did, just like many things were made. If you wanted to build a boat back in the day, you did it out in your yard. Uh, well, they wanted to make a surfboard, so they did that out in the yard. Uh, and they, they even started selling them there. Um, what, you know, John's father, his parents owned Connor's Market there in Buxton, and they would sell their surfboards right out front um, in the summertime. 
So we had all kinds of stories like that. You know, North Carolina is starting to get recognized now in the surfing community. Uh, you know, for a long time on the East Coast, F Florida and New Jersey seemed to be the really well-known spots for surfing. Um, and it might have just been that the population was larger and it was being promoted more. Uh, but here's a, a picture out of this Atlantic Surfing Magazine, uh, surfing at Wrightsville Beach, 1967. Here's a international surfing magazine, Surfer, and that was one of those 1966 photos um, up at Kitty Hawk. Uh, so you know, people are starting to, to realize that the surfing in North Carolina can actually be pretty good sometimes. Uh, this was from the same um, Surfer magazine. Uh, there's the cars headed down Highway 12 on Hatteras Island. Here's some, some several. Here's some various uh, photos from from the magazines. Uh, this is in Nags Head. Uh, now this picture uh, came from a gentleman from from uh, Atlantic Beach area. This is surfing in between um, the Sportsman's Pier and the Oceanana Pier. So the picture is actually taken from the sportsman's, which no longer exists. Um, the Oceanan is still there for now. Um, and the picture was taken in December, 1964. And if you look at the surf, look at Bob Freeman here surfing, he's, he's in sh a tank top and shorts. And the water temperature in, in December around here gets pretty chilly, but that's how bad he wanted to go surfing. And you'd hear story, I, I would talk to these gentlemen that were surfing in the sixties and they said, oh, they, they didn't care. They wanted to get out there and they'd turn blue and shiver to death almost, but they got to go surfing. Um, and before some of them had a car it, it, and they, they couldn't make it over the Atlantic Beach Bridge with their big heavy surfboard, they, if they lived in Moorhead City, they actually paddled across Bogue Sound and then walked across the island and then went surfing. Uh, they were dedicated. Uh, so here's another shot from the magazines uh, down at Fort Fisher. Um, you know, so th this was an interesting time period because, you know, some people were really into the sport. Others did not want to have anything to do with it. Uh, maybe especially some of the fishermen that were on the piers. <laughs> um, and, and so a lot of the communities and towns were actually banning surfing in there, or they were only allowing it in certain areas or at certain times. So some people that had property along the beach would set up these surf clubs. This is a picture of one in Kitty Hawk. Um, the Kitty Hawk Surf Club. Uh, and the little building on the left was actually where uh, Don Bennett, who was originally from New Bern, he would sell surfboards out of that building there. Um, and someone told me that that was Don right there. And maybe he was like, hey, don't you want to buy a board? Come on in, as everyone was coming and going here. And I think this was a busy day because there was a surfing contest taking place. Um, some of you might have seen these license plates. That was the club there, the Kitty Hawk Surf Club, and you could get a license plate, and then that's how they knew you were in the club, and that you could park there on the side of the road, and, and they didn't care. Um, now, there was also a little supermarket. I think it was Anderson's right across the street, and they would rent surfboards too. Um, so here's a surf club uh, from down at the New Hanover County uh, area, um, South Island Surf Club out of Carolina Beach, I think. Um, but you see in the foreground on the board, there's trophies. So inevitably, you, know, you, you have these clubs, then human nature, you start to get competitive. You could say, well, I can do that better than you. And so you want to have a competition. And so they started to get organized and have contests. And uh, here's a picture of the, one of the early surfing contests in Kitty Hawk in 1965. They all got their boards out. Um, Everyone's on the beach, but notice nobody's down by the pier, and it's probably because they said no surfing uh, by the pier, and understandably so. I mean, when you get into the study of recreation and why it happens and where it happens and who does it, uh, you start to understand that there's also conflicts in recreation, um, and so there was a conflict here between those fishing and those surfing, um, and someone has to make a concession somewhere um, so both activities can take place. Uh, this was out of a, uh, the surfing contest results out of a 1967 magazine, but I wanted to put this up there as an example because you know, surfing tended to be a male-oriented sport, but it didn't mean that women couldn't get out there and surf. Um, we do see in the, in the uh, list of winners of this contest, there's a 
You know, there's a boys division, a junior men's, a, a men's division, and a senior men's, but there's only a girls division. There was no, um, you know, junior girls division or a women's division. And why was that? Why weren't they out there surfing? But, you know, things have changed, thankfully. Uh, and I think with surfing that was in the Olympics, uh, USA taking gold in the women's. And that was Carissa Moore out of Hawaii, uh, Hawaiian um, native there. Uh, but even in North Carolina, the women are competing in surfing. And this was a contest out of uh, Wrightsville Beach um, from not too long ago. Um, so we're kind of moving along uh, the 70s. Uh, you know, the popularity kind of kind of starts to, to wane a little bit. Um, but in certain stretches along the coast, especially the Outer Banks, where the surfing was the best, um, you have a few diehards that stick with it. This is a Hatteras Island surf shop, which happened to be in the old uh, Rodanthe post office there. You see the Volkswagen bus and surfboards in the window. Um, in the 70s, uh, a lot of the surfers from California and Hawaii got a little taste of what North Carolina offered. We had the U.S. Surfing Championships held in Buxton uh, three times, 1974, um, 1978 and again in 1982 and it was said that the Hawaiians and Californians were really impressed and surprised and they actually brought the wrong type of surfboard they were expecting the waves to be small and weak and mushy and crumbly um, and not have good form to them but they, and they actually got here and were, and were really taken aback by it um, and in that, those years there were even some uh, east coast surfers that that won the titles um, yeah, so there is a, a history there too to uh, surfing in North Carolina and, and having the opportunity and having some good waves to ride, having places like Whalebone Surf Shop to get uh, a surfboard from. Um, you know, this, this uh, gentleman here on, on the right, that's Scott uh, Busby, he had a shop in Buxton. Um, you know, they had to do with what they had. Uh, there weren't many opportunities. There weren't a lot of storefronts. He, he's set up his operation in an old burger joint. Uh, and he said for a long time, it still smelled like greasy hamburgers. And it was, it took a while before that smell to be replaced by the, the fiberglass and the resin uh, and the surfboard wax uh, smells and aromas. Um, but he made surfboards uh, labeled in the eye, as in in the eye of the hurricane, um, because surfers began to realize on the East Coast that um, the hurricane swells that were generated from approaching storms actually made for really good conditions. Um, they just didn't ever want to get hit by the storm, uh, but they just wanted to surf the waves. This was a, uh, the next decade, the 80s. Um, surfing starts to kind of see this resurgence, if you will, and maybe it's the fashion, you know, I don't know, the style of the clothing, the lifestyle idea. Um, these were, this is Mickey McCarthy on the left and, and um, Rasco Hunt on the right. Uh, you kind of had this, um, they're making surfboards there in Nags Head. You kind of had this same respect uh, of mentoring surfboard shapers and makers uh, as you did in the boat building world. And this parallel I thought was pretty interesting. You know, there were a lot of families that passed on boat building traditions in Eastern North Carolina uh, or to relatives um, and it, that's how it was done. You were kind of an apprenticeship. Well, surfboard making in North Carolina was kind of the same way. You would have someone that would get into it and then the younger folks would come around and they would then teach them the trade and show them how it was done uh, and, and kind of pass that on. You know, there was no classes in it. You, you know, you, you, this is an apprenticeship, you know, type operation. This was a, you know, hands-on work. You didn't learn in a school how to make a surfboard. Um, nowadays, you can watch it on, on YouTube and, and do it, but there's nothing like experiencing it firsthand from someone that has been doing it for many years. Um, so, you know, we, North Carolina it, in the 90s, they start to get more uh, recognition for surfing. Um, this was, again, another uh, international magazine, but you see here, Cape Hatteras goes off, dancing in the graveyard, and that's referring to the graveyard of the Atlantic. Um, but there was a whole article uh, on, on surfing on the Outer Banks and it had pick color photographs and talked about the, leaving a little bit about the history of, of the Outer Banks and the shipwrecks and Blackbeard and the Pirate. Um, but it was stuff like that that 
was pushing and promoting the the, the sport uh, in North Carolina. So there, there was, you know, and really from there, the, the, the sky is kind of the limit. Um, the types of uh, tricks and, and, and maneuvers and, and things that, that uh, the, the younger crowd is doing today is pretty remarkable. Um, to be able to fly up into the air and land back on the wave and keep riding. Um, this picture is taken up uh, in uh, Dare County as well. Um, yeah, but there's a, you people will, will, will inevitably say, oh, you can, you can surf here, you can ride waves in North Carolina. I thought that was just in Hawaii and California um, and other places in the world, but you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not true. Um, you know, ask those early lifesavers that had to row out to those shipwreck victims and pluck survivors off of the off of the vessel that was as it was being torn to pieces. You know, they had to get through 15 to 20 foot waves sometimes if they could. Um, but we know that the surf can get large uh, from those accounts, um, and we and we can even see it happen. So this is a. a nautical chart of Cape Hatteras, and it tends to stick way out in, farther than anywhere else along our coastline. Um, you have these treacherous shoals here, uh, you have deep water, and you can have swells approaching from any angle from the north all the way around to the southwest. So it's one of the reasons it makes it such a great uh, location for surfing. Um, and, and sometimes the waves get pretty big. So there was this this particular uh, incident in November of 2007, um, Hurricane uh, Noel had, had just formed and, and was spinning off the coast and heading north. And they were sending, it was sending swells to Hatteras of the 20, 15 to 25 foot range and maybe even a few 30 footers. And so some of the young kids there, some of the young surfers on Hatteras Island, they took jet skis and they went out to those waves they launched the jet skis into the surf and they would tow their friends into these breakers, into these waves. Uh, somebody snapped a, a picture. Um, and I don't know if this was with a telephoto lens off the beach or if they were on one of the skis, but um, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but this was a, I, I did actually, I think they were taking video footage and I took a still shot from the uh, video footage um, to show you these waves that were breaking there at Hatteras and then you can see a white line coming down the face of this wave well that's somebody on a surfboard so I'll circle it right there for you um, now it's definitely no you know Waimea Bay it's definitely no you know uh, Piahi which is known as Jaws uh, off of Oahu um, it's not even on the other side of the Atlantic in uh, Portugal, there's a world renowned break with waves of hundred feet. It, it's not at that level, but for the East coast of the United States, this is pretty impressive. And the fact that, that that's what they're doing in, in, in trying these things. Um, so you know, the, the history of the sport in North Carolina goes back farther than some imagine. And sometimes the waves are bigger than you might think. Um, this was a shot of one of the, a, uh, a professional surfer from North Carolina, Jesse Hines. Um, you know, there's been several fellows that, uh, and, 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 and some women too, that come out of the state that uh, got pretty good at, at, at riding, riding the waves. Um, but, but, you know, in the end, uh, competitions aside, um, you know, skill level aside, it, it, it really has always kind of been a story of, just having fun with your friends, getting out to the beach, working on your tan, cooling off in the water, um, and, and just making those good, good memories. Um, I wanted to put a uh, special thanks slide up here to a lot of people that um, I talked to and that shared information uh, with me and images, uh, stories, um, you know, magazine articles and such to help us put together uh, this timeline of, of the sport of surfing in North Carolina. Um, so that was it for the presentation. Uh, I hope that you all enjoyed it. Um, and if you do have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any online. Um, it doesn't look like we have any hands raised or anything, but do you all have any questions here in the audience? Yes. 
Good question. When, when did surfing become an Olympic sport? Yeah. There, there were, there were some, yeah. So they, they, in the Olympics, I think it was in Japan, summer Olympics, the last one, uh, I think was the first official um, time that it would, that surfing was in the Olympics. Um, but they got that, 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 I remember watching in the 80s. And yes. Once yep. A, once a year, go to Hawaii. Yeah, that was so yeah, so they tried to, in the 80s, they tried to get it, the sport into the Olympics on several occasions, and it never panned out. It was pretty tough. Uh, they re it was really not viewed as a sport. It was viewed as something that you just did for fun, and as a hobby, and it could never be replicated in, a, in, in such a venue as the, the World Olympics. Um, but, it, but nowadays, uh, you know, if the Olympics are held anywhere in a country that has a coastline, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be an ocean. <laughs> People can surf on the Great Lakes in the United States, <laughs> and they can surf anywhere. And now you have wave pools where waves are created in a man-made environment, and you could easily have surfing as a competition. So, um, yes. yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. You have a question, sir? Yes. The, the newspaper article that I had up there. Yeah, so that was the name of the paper. So you had a question about why was that paper uh, done in 1888? Um, well, that newspaper was an old newspaper. I don't think they print it anymore. And the title of the paper was Fisherman and Farmer because it had a lot of news about, you know, the local fishing and farming in the area around Edenton. And it might have talked about the shad run on the Chowan River, or it might have talked about, you know, how good the crops were that year. Um, and that's why, that's where that was from. But it just happened to run a little article in there about, about surfing. Uh, good. And another question. Yes. Yeah, um, I, so I had spent a lot of time talking and working with Buddy's sister, Lisa. And uh, she actually put me in, yeah, um, sure can. She put me in touch with um, uh, the, the um, a printing office that helped with, with our publication here. And she told me a lot about Buddy, but I was having trouble finding a lot of like actual documentation. And she kept saying, you know, you know my other brother's got you know, all this stuff on the contest that he did and entered. And I found some stuff here and there um, about him. I mean, he was, he was Carteret County's probably best known surfer and professional surfer from Carteret County. Uh, and he, he competed at the uh, international level um, and he won several um, uh, national competitions uh, and he placed really high in a lot of other uh, uh, competitions. Um, but this, the foundation um, went on at, uh, in, in recognition of him and he passed away, um, in, you, I guess it was maybe 10, 15 years ago. And um, yeah, so the foundation that they started was to promote uh, the sport and to help uh, kids from the area, um, you know, get scholarships to go on to school, um, to promote uh, surfing as an activity uh, to, and also, um, render aid to uh, hurricane victims, uh, communities that were devastated by hurricanes. So I didn't have anything in this slideshow in particular about them, um, but there is in here, you'll find um, uh, about Buddy Pelletier. And, and some of the stuff in the exhibit that we have in the auditorium is uh, uh, tied to Buddy. Um, I think we have a model of one of his surfboards. We've got one of his trophies maybe. Uh, in a shirt that he had from a competition. He, I think he later went on and lived in Puerto Rico and he, he entered a lot of the competitions that were there in Puerto Rico. It was kind of like his home away from home, if you will. Um, but there's still a lot that, that to be recorded on him um, that's, I think that uh, his brother has information on for like how many competitions and such that he won and such. Uh, but a real, really, from what I understand, really well-known fella very uh, uh very polite and kind and and uh and and, and really got uh cheered uh 
um, much more so in the surfing world than a lot of the other uh, professionals, people just loved watching him surf. And so he would go for a wave and before he ever even stood up, they said that people would just start cheering and yelling and clapping because they knew he was gonna do something really spectacular. Uh, and he was he was so good at it. He made it look so easy. Uh, and the judges would uh, the 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 rule the judges and 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 um, organizations would 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 uh, change the rules and stuff. And he'd be like, "That's fine, you know. Okay, well now the board can only be this size. Like, no problem. Doesn't matter to me. You know, I could ride anything. He probably could have rode in a wooden plank and still top, you know, uh, in first place. So um, really, it, uh, he was one of the ones that. His sister was, he told me that he would paddle across Bogue Sound to go surfing. His mom and dad didn't necessarily like that he was spending so much time surfing, but so he would hide his surfboard at his friend's house under the house or down the street or something. And he'd sneak off and go, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, do you have a question? Yes, I yes. do. What's your question? My cousin down in Florida surfs. Oh, yeah. And he, his daughter surfs too. It's a great place. I was wondering if you I learned to surf like my cousins? Could you learn? I bet you could. You know, well, the first place to start is do you know how to swim? I knew how to swim. That's a, that's a good step. Knowing how to swim and then even maybe just getting on a board and laying on your belly and riding a wave in that way. Start that way first. That's the best way to start. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming to the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And th and there's been a lot of that um, across the state. I think they had something at Riceville Beach, the uh, the annual Wahine um, competition. Um, but but you know. Surfers also have um, delved into this, the world of uh, bringing um, uh, people that may not have considered surfing into the sport for therapeutical reasons. Um, those folks with autism, there's surfers surfing with uh, surfers healing, and it brings uh, disabled folks or folks with autism, um, wounded warriors. Uh, to get out, and, and there's something about the sport, the activity itself, of being out there in the water, riding the wave, that it kind of does something, you know, um, you know, for your psyche, if you will, uh, that is that is healing in a way. Uh, maybe it's the positive ions in the salt water. Maybe it's you know, you know, the 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 the, the speed and thrill and forgetting about everything else, or or for those that do have maybe a physical disability or or mental disability, to to get out there and um, you know, realize that they can do something too. That they're, they're not confined to being labeled as someone with a disability. That that they can get out there and with help, they they'll ride a ride a surfboard in in to the beach. Um, so it's pretty amazing. Um, things you want to think about, you know, the the Wounded Warriors project of military that that uh, suffer from PTSD, being able to get out there and go surfing, the, and and surfers um, are very proud about doing those kinds of things. Not to mention the fact that a lot of us have gotten out there and rescued people, um, not as lifeguards, not as not as lifesavers, but as surfers because we happen to be there and at the right spot at the right time and to pull someone from a rip current whose eyes are open as wide as can be because they're scared to death or, um, uh, and potentially may drown uh, is, is a pretty uh, pretty awesome experience. Uh, and I don't want to have to do it, but to do it and say that you've done it is, you know, kind of, kind of something makes you feel good about yourself. So, but thank, yeah, thanks for coming. We'll take you all. Please enjoy the exhibit on, on surfing oh, okay. uh, for more images and artifacts and replicas. Okay. Yeah. So powers, oh. oh, right, right. At, uh, at my, the Banks Library. Yeah, it wasn't too long ago, was it? <laughs> Are these handouts? Some of these lectures, too.
the history museum in Moorhead. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you can take one of those. They, yeah. you know, we would try to get some folks from the Valley of Hell. Wow, nice. Yeah, yeah. Lisa, yeah. Was not there. yeah, she's having yeah. some health. Yeah, and I think her sister, she's taking. Oh.